everyone. I am really, really uh, happy to be here and talk to you about something that I'm very excited about and something that I really, really enjoy. And I really hope that this time uh, for you will be a time that we can just uh, get into what I think is some of the more uh, fun parts of reading a text. Uh, we may ask why we would do literary criticism and why we would begin to look at biblical documents as pieces of literature. And I think I want to say right up front that the reason that I find this such a compelling method to use and the reason that I enjoy using it so much is because I think that there's something very human uh, that we connect with when we read something as literature. When we enter into stories, that goes back to the way that we communicate already as people and the way that we understand the world around us. Just to give uh, a very brief example, if any of you have kids or you know kids, uh, these are great books. They're the Guardian series where they go through the different childhood figures like Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and things like this. And the author has crafted these really amazing sort of heroic epic tales about how they came to be the guardians of childhood. And they're really magical, uh, wonderful books. And my kids and I have really enjoyed them. But the other night I was reading to my son, who's seven, and there was this part in the story that was really very deep and somewhat frightening. Uh, some children had been kidnapped by the Nightmare King, who only wants to steal innocence from children and wants to make them afraid. And the one person who was witness to this has to tell the heroes who have come in what happened. And this observer, this witness, says, I am trying. And I hate the feeling I'm having. This is a scared feeling. But I am stronger by the telling of this tale. And he says that as he finishes telling this dark and frightening story. And my son, who's seven and who has had a really rough time dealing with something in his life recently, said, I know that's true. He just stopped me. I was ready to move on to the next chapter, but he said, I know that's true. And I said, well, how do you know that's true? He said, because when I was really sad about something and I finally talked about it, it really hurt, but I felt better afterwards realized that there was something in his experience that was bearing witness to something that someone else's experience had also borne witness to. And so when we read literature, it has this dual uh, effect. It both, like C.S. Lewis tells us, it describes reality. It explains what's true, but it also helps create what's true. It helps shape our identities, and it very much shapes our realities. And so I think it's very important to look at these documents as pieces of literature so that we have that extra dimension when we read the Bible. So we're going to first ask, what is literary criticism? And what we're really doing today is we are moving our perspective in how we're looking at the New Testament documents. The first term up there is that the, when you read from a literary critical perspective, you're looking at it through a synchronic perspective. And we'll unpack what that means. Synchronic means within time, in one time, versus diachronic, which means through time. Now, the other methods that we've used, particularly textual criticism and historical criticism and coming up after uh, we're finished with literary criticism, we'll get into redaction criticism. Those look at how the texts came to be. How did they evolve through time? How were they written? What traditions gave birth to them? Uh, looking at various manuscripts. What that's doing is it's saying, how did these things come to be through time? But when we look at something from a literary critical perspective, what we're asking is just more of a, a snapshot. It is captured in time. And so what it does is it really emphasizes the final form. So we're not asking how the document was written. We're entering the document to see what it says about itself. <clears throat> 
And so what we're doing is before, when we're looking at it from a text critical or a historical critical perspective, we're applying an external logic, meaning here's the text, and I am aware that I am outside the text, and I'm going to use other criteria or standards or certain types of logic to examine the text, and those are all good and all fine. But when we use a literary critical perspective, what we're doing is getting inside the text and seeing how would it evaluate itself on its own terms. We have to essentially assume what the text assumes. We have to enter into its world and see how it describes the world, how it sets itself, how it describes its characters, and to a certain extent, we kind of have to play along with it. Whereas when we're doing other forms of criticism, for instance, textual criticism or historical criticism, we sometimes describe it as we have to suspend belief. We have to not rush into the theological or rush into just acknowledging that the text is um, completely whatever, you know, authentic or completely original or any of those things. We have to have a certain amount of distance. Literary criticism asks that you actually suspend disbelief, that temporarily you place yourself within the text and you allow it to have its say and then at the end you can step back and say okay now that I've understood what it's saying what sense do I make of it and so because we do that we have to ask a different set of questions than what we would normally ask so for instance when we were looking at uh, things from a historical perspective we say who wrote this document where did it come from? How did it get here? When we, when we ask these different set of questions, we don't say, Is, did this happen? Did Jesus actually you know, cleanse the temple or however we want to categorize what, what the, um, the scene that was that day? When did this happen? We're not asking that question. We're asking, why did the author put that here and now in the text? What is it doing? What's its purpose there as it relates to the whole? So what this shifts for us in our perspective is we are now looking at New Testament writers as authors, meaning that they didn't just sort of inherit a big stack of stories about Jesus or about uh, the early church or about church doctrine, but that they have a goal in mind that before they write that there is something that they want us as readers to know, that they want us to walk away with a complete picture of something. And because they have that purpose, they have that end goal, they also have a strategy for how to get there. And we're going to talk about two of those strategies today. One of them is narrative. The author can get us to that final picture by telling us a story and all of the elements of the story will add up to that goal and the other way is through rhetoric that sometimes an author especially in letters or in speeches what we often get is that the, the author is going to get us to that accomplishment get us to that finished product through persuasive speech so if we see the New Testament writers as authors we also have to see their documents as literary compositions with their own unity, meaning there aren't sort of throwaway pieces. There aren't pieces in there that are just stuck in there because the author just didn't know what else to do with them. So what this is doing is it's looking at our New Testament documents uh, as a completed composition and not as scrapbooks. And I don't mean scrapbooks in the modern sense. I don't mean ones that have plenty of literary unity, you know, where they've got fancy themes and, and threads through them and where pictures at the beach actually have real sand around them. I'm not talking about those kinds of scrapbooks. I'm talking about the kind of scrapbook that my grandmother did, old school scrapbooking. You know, I'm sure how many of you have something like this from your grandmother where your grandmother saved everything you ever did? So you've got uh, let's see, a ballet recital program and a picture from kindergarten graduation and your high school program when you graduated and pictures of you 
naked on a rocking horse. And you know what I'm saying? There's all kinds of stuff in there. And I know exactly what my grandmother's logic was. That fits on this page. Okay? There is enough space on this page to stick that thing. That'll work there. There is not, at least I hope not, there is not an overarching picture that my grandmother really hopes that anyone who looks through this scrapbook will come away and say, I have a really good idea of exactly who she is. And <laughs> Again, that's why I said I, I hope not. But what my grandmother was doing was she was preserving. She, I don't say inherited, but she received, bless her heart, everything I ever did. And uh, she loved me. She thought that I was important. I was her first grandchild. She was very excited. Everything I did was brand new. The first one to graduate. The first one who lost a tooth. The first one she potty trained. Okay, so she was very excited about this, and she felt like she needed to preserve these memories, and she kept telling me every time, you'll want this someday. Someday you will want this. You will want your junior year of high school research paper. That, I, I took that out before I came in, so no one see that. Uh, but that's the logic of how the, the, the authors had previously been seen. Not to that extent, and that that is uh, a bit of an exaggeration in order to, to get the point across, but that it used to be looked at, especially in the Gospels, that what the Gospel writers were doing is that they inherited a bunch of stories about Jesus, especially Mark's Gospel. And so if we look at this, this theory was called the string of pearls. So you could imagine Mark sitting down and he's writing his Gospel and he's got basically a big bucket of beads. And he's like, oh, there's the feeding of the 5,000. That's a good one. And he reaches in and, oh, oh, that's the story about John the Baptist being beheaded. Got to put that one on there too. And then he's basically just, I've got all this stuff and I have to put it in some type of a literary composition or some type of a document so other people can read it. It can be preserved. And if we looked at this and we just looked at how these different pericopes are described, it, it could be tempting to say, maybe so. What do these things have to do with each other? There's a beheading of John the Baptist. Good times. Feeding of the 5,000. Walking on water. Well, okay, already here we have a beheading, uh, which is not a miracle. Uh, we've got a feeding of the 5,000. Okay, that's a miracle, but it's about eating. And then we've got Jesus walking on the water. Okay, those don't appear to have anything really to do with each other. And so it, it was tempting to just look at this that Mark's just compiling. He's just putting these things together in order for them to be preserved and passed on. But then literary criticism comes along with its subgenre that is one of my favorites that's narrative criticism and says, whoa, 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 not so fast. Uh, if we look at this as a story, and we start with this as its perspective, and we start looking for the unity, looking for the narrative unity within this, there may be more to this than simply a string of pearls. And so whenever we read any kind of a narrative, whether you're reading uh, E. Aster, Bunnymund, and the Warrior Eggs at the Earth's Core, or you're reading the Gospel of Mark, there are certain things that you're going to look for and certain things that we're already primed to look for. As soon as we watch a movie, as soon as we, we read a children's storybook, as soon as someone starts giving their testimony in church, we're already looking for these things. We're looking for where is it set? What's the time of day? What's the occasion? Is it a festival? Is it the Sabbath? Is it a funeral? Those things matter, and those things give us interpretive clues for this is probably how you are going to want to take this. We start looking at the plot, and this is one of the really important things about reading a narrative is that it's meant to be read in sequence. Whenever you're doing any kind of literary criticism, it's very important to read the entire document from start to finish. You cannot take any one piece and simply analyze it on itself because it is part of a narrative whole. So we're looking at what came before this particular, this particular part of the story. 
or this pericope or this speech. And what's going to come after it that this might be foreshadowing? It might be uh, setting up some type of irony or paradox. It may set us up for a plot twist. What's the conflict? Who is opposing whom and over what? Who are the characters? Who's doing the speaking? Who's being spoken to? Does this particular part of the narrative explain the person's character better? Do we think, aha, I get it now why they were doing that? Or does it seem in complete conflict or contrast to what's come before? And does the narrator, bless you, does the narrator offer any inner explanations? Do we get a look at what's going on in a character's head that's giving us extra sort of clues on how to interpret this? And then when we back up, we also have to look at other storytelling devices. Are there motifs? Is there a theme going on? And as we look at Mark, and I know most of you were in NT501 last semester, what's one of the big themes in Mark? Secrecy, yes. Shh. Tell everyone. Okay, secrecy is a, it's a theme. It's a motif that keeps coming up. Okay. And then we have tropes, and those are kind of how those themes and motifs get expressed. So we're going to look at what one of those uh, uh, tropes is here in a moment. But now that we have these in our minds, we're going to go through these from Mark 6, 17 to 8, 21, and we're just going to look for these things. And I think you'll find that it's a lot of fun. And it's really illuminating, and it starts to make sense of what do all these things have to do with one another. So 617, for Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Sounds like a Springer episode. Because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing he was a righteous and holy man, and protected him. And when he heard him, he was greatly perplexed. Oh. <laughs> and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. And when his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give it, even half my kingdom. So what do we have in terms of setting? Okay, it's a banquet. And we can probably assume that if it's a banquet for a king on his birthday, it's in a, in a palace, some kind of a royal court. Okay, so we, we definitely are already constructing something in our minds that this is lavish, probably extravagant, uh, in lesser terms, fancy. Okay, there's, there's lots of stuff going on here. There's lots of people. And who are the people in the setting? Who do, are the characters that we meet? Okay, Herodias. Do we know anything about her now? Yeah, so she's got a grudge, and a grudge symbol uh, signifies that there's something going on. So that's part of the conflict. We know already somebody doesn't like somebody else. What do we know about Herod? Well, he seems to be a man of his word. Okay. He, he does seem to respect him. 
Yes. Okay. So we do have this kind of conflicted uh, person in Herod. He does want to please people. Okay. So even though he's the person who's in charge, he does want to please. He wants to maybe show off. He does want to entertain. And when he is, when he's enraptured by this dance, he just gives away up to half of his kingdom if that's what she wants. Well, I think that there are probably some universals. When we talk about banquet, I think that there are some stable things that are always there. We're always, I mean, especially here, who's picturing lots of alcohol? Okay. Who's picturing lots of food? Okay. Who's picturing people dressed up? I think we've got a uni some, some universal things there that are enough to at least establish a basic setting. Now, we may not be able to fully furnish in our minds historically what that looks like in the text, but remember that the author is, is trusting that the reader will supply those things in their imagination. When you write, and he was at a banquet, you are giving trust to your audience that they can supply the mental imagery of what a banquet looks like. So there, and that's a good question because there is a relationship going on between the text and the reader. It's not the reader separate from the text. Like you said, we have entered the text and we are also supplying some of these things in our own imaginations because that's what we do when someone tells us a story. Now, how about, we've talked about that there's this, the, there, there are certain themes but there's also a trope here. When we talk about it being set at a banquet, this is going to come back up when we look at the next part of this. So verse 24 says, she went out, so this is the daughter, she went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? And she replied, the head of John the baptizer. And immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was deeply grieved. Obviously, he didn't want to break his promise, especially in front of all of his friends. And immediately, he sent a soldier with orders to bring John's head, and he went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Isn't it ironic that this is at a banquet? And what's his head on? Yeah, <laughs> this is kind of a gruesome banquet. And the author is playing with this trope of banqueting and eating and feasting, we have a human head on a platter. That's a bit of a plot twist. I mean, if you went to a banquet yourself and there was a human head on a platter, you would think, this isn't what I expected. <laughs> and how could they afford that? I mean, so, but then we move into the very next pericope. And I've skipped a, a few verses, but I think we all know who he is in this one. It's Jesus. And as Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd. And he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. So when we look at what's come before this, who's the main character in the banquet scene? Herod, right. And he's the king. And kings have subjects. Is Herod a good king? No, he not to John. <laughs> he just beheaded one at a party. And immediately we have another character who is also a leader and who sees that he has subjects. Uh, it's hard to say that, but kind of. Okay, sheep, shepherd. We kind of get that there is this uh, idea, this play between being a shepherd and being a king. And he has compassion on them. He's concerned about their well-being. 
And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place. There's a setting. Palace versus a deserted place. And the hour is now very late. Send them away so that they can go to the surrounding country and villages and buy something for themselves to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said, how are we going to go out and buy enough bread for all of these people? This is going to cost a fortune. And he says, how many loaves do you have? And he says, they, he says, go and see. So they found out and they said, five and two fish. And then he ordered them all to sit the people down in groups on the green grass. Yeah, Kathy? Very good. Yes. Yes. Yes, and I hope if everyone didn't hear that, he says in the first scene we have a banquet scene with lots of people and lots of food and a king who has no compassion. And here we have lots of people with no food and we have Jesus who has compassion and the end result is completely different because this ends with verse 42, and all ate and were filled. That gives us the idea that not even one person was left out. Whereas the end of the banquet scene before that, somebody somebody got the stick end of the lollipop. Okay. <laughs> and then the very next pericope. And then he had his disciples get into the boat. So now we've changed settings once again. And he doesn't get in the boat. He goes up on a mountain. He's above them. And then when he saw that they were straining at the oars because a big storm has kicked up, he walks out onto the water. When I was a kid, I always thought he was showing off. And when they saw him, they were terrified. And he spoke to them and said, take heart. It's me. Don't be afraid. And then he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves. What does bread have to do with this? This is the trope. There's loaves and loaves and a head on a platter. This theme of eating and food and being filled continually comes back up, and it's running like a thread through each one of these pericopes. Even as the settings are changing, even as the characters are being developed, we still have this continuity, this unity throughout the text. And then this is also an awful story. I never liked this one either. Uh, and then he goes to Tyre. And he enters a house. And a Syrophoenician woman, who's a Gentile, comes up and asks for her daughter to be healed. And he says to her, and I just hate this, he says to her, let the children be fed first, for it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Oh. And she answered him, but sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, for saying that, you can go, and your daughter's been healed. Even here, we have this theme of being fed. We have crumbs of bread dropping from a table. And what this trope is trying to show us is that this woman understood who Jesus was. She gets what the bread means. The disciples don't. It says they just don't understand about the loaves. But look what happened when, when the, that one was finished, that they got out of the boat. The people recognized him. They knew who he was. 
so what this is is this trope of bread and eating is constantly feeding no pun intended into mark's secrecy theme about who is jesus who is this guy that even the wind and the sea obey him who is this who teaches with such authority And then this one, I think, is, I, I, I love this one because you just really see Jesus lose it. Um, and any of you who have children have had this exact discussion. Now, the disciples had forgotten to bring any bread. And they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, watch out. Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. Oh, there's yeast. Okay. And of Herod. And they said to one another, oh. He's mad because we didn't bring any bread. <laughs> and becoming aware of it, Jesus said to them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes and fail to see? Do you have ears and fail to hear? Are you blind? Are you deaf? Do you not remember? What's wrong with you? I broke five loaves for 5,000. And then seven for 4,000. And he says, do you not yet understand? Now, the interesting thing is, they didn't understand, but the reader, the person looking at this in a literary whole, is starting to get it. The more we read, the more we're saying, huh, this keeps coming up. Why does this author keep mentioning bread? Why do we keep seeing Jesus in these different miracles? And people recognizing him, but these are people who we wouldn't expect would recognize him. What's going on with this? And this is Mark's way of threading that secrecy throughout. And what this is, is this is showing how when you're looking at a literary document, all of the parts relate to the whole. They all work together to make that literary unity. There aren't just throwaways. This is a, a quote from Huckleberry Finn. How many of you guys have ever read Huckleberry Finn? Okay, good. For those of you who haven't, I think this will actually be very interesting to you too. So don't worry if you haven't read this. Because this is an interesting quote that if you didn't read Huckleberry Finn, or it was just lifted out of Huckleberry Finn, you would get a very different impression of what was going on in this situation. This is uh, Huck. He's a prepubescent boy. And he says... It was a close place. I took up the letter I'd written to Miss Watson and I held it in my hand. I was a trembling because I'd got to decide forever betwixt two things. And I noted. I studied it a minute, sort of holding my breath, and then I says to myself, all right then, I'll go to hell. And tore it up. It was awful thoughts and awful words, but they was said, and I let them stay said, and never thought no more about reforming. Now, if we didn't know anything else about this story, what would you say just happened? Anybody want to venture a guess? What just happened? Okay. He was about to do something. He was wavering between two options. And does he go with what he knows is right or what he knows is wrong? Wrong. Yes. This leads us to think, based on just this expression, that he's choosing between two things and he purposely chooses what he knows is wrong. This kid kind of looks like a punk, you know? So, but if we put this in the context of the entire story of Huckleberry Finn, we know that this is doing a lot of different things. First, this is a huge turning point in the plot. This is the moment that Huck has been leading up to. He's with a runaway slave who's his friend, who he loves, and who has been a good friend to him. And he has to decide whether he's going to go along with the social conventions of slavery or against them. And all of those, those things, those people have taught him, uh, his aunt and the people in society have said that this is the way it should be and ought to be. And he is making his own decision here. This is the moment that Huck really becomes his own moral agent. And so we know that this is actually when Huck is doing something very right. He's going with his own sense of what's right and wrong as opposed to the social uh, pressures of what others think is right and wrong. 
But the way the parts relate to the whole is that you would never know that unless you had this in the context of the entire novel. If you hadn't read everything up to it, and you knew how Huck's character had been developing, and you knew how the plot had been uh, uh, developing. But the plot also wouldn't be complete without this part. So it's not just that the parts uh, are explained by the whole, but all of these parts contribute to the whole and complete it. It's kind of a dialectical relationship. But then there's also looking at something from the other way, which is what's the relationship of the whole first to the parts? And this is where we can talk about genre. We start asking, we've established by looking at Mark that it is literary, that you can read this literarily. So then another question we sometimes have to ask is, well, what, what kind of literature is it? What does the whole tell us about how to interpret the parts? very first verse of John's Apocalypse gives us something like this. He says that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is an apocalypse. Okay? And he, God, Jesus, sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. So he tells us right up front, this is an apocalypse. And there's a quote here from G.B. Caird who says that when John calls this an apocalypse, he's not just saying what is in the this literary document, what the contents are, but he's also giving us a clue as to how to interpret it. This is a recognized type of literature, and it has its own sort of rules for reading and interpreting it. First, it depicts a present situation in a context of world history. It depicts contemporary struggle in context of cosmic battle between good and evil. It points towards an ultimate victory by God over the real and present danger, and it's written in highly symbolic language. Those are all clues to the reader because of what kind it is. This is how to interpret it. So this is how we turn literary criticism and we look at what's the whole. This so before we were looking at the gospel genre, and here you can look at apocalyptic genre, and you know by the whole how to interpret those parts. And I just have a very brief... Uh, push play. A very brief clip. How many of you have seen uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind? Oh, whoops. Here we go. I hate, I hate, I hate these potatoes. There's a dead fly in my potato. I guess you've noticed something 
with the little streams with Dad. <laughs> If this was a drama, just a straight up drama, how would you interpret this particular situation? He's lost it, okay? Maybe some kind of trauma, some type of mental illness. There's something strange going on. But when we know the genre, and when we know what type of film this is, we get it. Those mashed potatoes do mean something. Those mashed potatoes are a sign for the Devil's Tower, which is a sign for where the aliens are going to meet. It's an alien movie. And so when we know something's an alien movie and people are acting strange, something's going on, okay? When we've watched the movie up to this point, we've seen that he's been burned by some kind of crazy UFO electricity accident that he's been having visions, that other people have had these encounters and are having strange visions. And so the fact that we know this is an alien movie, this makes total sense. Now, his wife wasn't there for all that, and she didn't watch the movie, and she thinks he's crazy. And I, I hate to give away some of the movie, but she actually takes the kids and leaves because she's afraid that he really has gone crazy. It's, it's a really sad part of the, the film. But this is really actually just a plug. It's an excellent film. You really should watch it. It's called Close Encounters of the Third Kind. So that's how sometimes when we look closely at the parts, we see how they make up the whole. And then sometimes when we move out to the whole, we see how that shapes our understanding of those parts. Again, the aliens. Now, I realize that in the chapter that I'm sure we've all read today uh, from Hayes and Holiday, that they tended to focus more on the, this part of literary criticism. And this is definitely a part of literary criticism, but they tend to focus more on that. Uh, and so that's why this lecture is really trying to has tried to focus more on looking at some of the narrative aspects just to try to balance that out so that you kind of get a fuller picture. And I think the reason that they did that is simply because literary criticism is such a very large uh, genre, it's a large method, that it can kind of be hard to cover everything in what, 10 pages that y'all read for today? 10 pages is pretty brief and that's hard to cover everything. But rhetorical criticism is another move. And the reason that I have it here is we've just started, we've been talking about how the whole relates to the parts. And I know, especially for those of you who are in NT501 last semester, we talked about Paul's letters and about how he kind of uses this standard format. So when we look at letters, when we look at speeches, when we look at, um, and, and rhetorical criticism and literary criticism and narrative, they're not mutually exclusive. There's lots of times where you have rhetoric and narrative mixing together. But for our purposes today, we're kind of separating them just a little bit, just so you can kind of get a basic idea. But we're already familiar with Paul's format. We're already familiar that he moves through a greeting, into a thanksgiving, into a body of his letter, and into a closing. And just the format itself can be rhetorical. For example, Raise your hand. Who knows the one letter of Paul's where there isn't a thanksgiving? Galatians. That's rhetorical that the thanksgiving is missing. Okay, He's making a persuasive point by using speech or sometimes even by not using a certain move. That's part of his normal format. That this format tells you something already about how Paul uses speech in order to per persuade people to what the argument that he's making 
And so even when one of those things is missing, it's still very important to his rhetorical strategy. So we're still looking at the whole. How does the whole inform the parts? So when Paul's writing letters, they're not postcards. He's not just keeping in touch. Okay, he doesn't just drop them a line. He has a purpose that he's writing, and he has a strategy for how he's going to accomplish that purpose. And in the reading for today, you probably looked at these three basic components of what ancient rhetoric looked like. And these things don't necessarily, again, mutually exclude one another. It's not as if you have uh, an appeal to authority that's outside of logic. You will find that logic runs through all of them, that there is some t type of coherence and order and purpose or strategy, regardless of which one is being employed at that time. And sometimes, even within the same passage, you'll have lots of different methods of persuasion being used. So just to orient ourselves, We'll just look at a letter that we've been looking at over the last couple weeks uh, in our colloquies, and lots of people have been writing on 1 Corinthians. And this is Paul's introduction to the letter to the Corinthians. So we'll just take the first couple of verses. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place Call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we go back to this and we look at an appeal to the speaker's authority or the source of that authority. Do you see that in the beginning of Paul's letter? How does he make that known? Exactly. So he states his authority and its source. You can't argue with that. My mother used to do this all the time. She would say whatever it was she wanted to say, and she's just like, and it, you can't disagree with that because that's the Holy Spirit speaking. <laughs> How do you argue with the Holy Spirit? Okay, You have to craft some really clever arguments if you want to argue with the Holy Spirit. Okay? <laughs> And I'm sure I'm not alone. I'm sure uh, other moms use this. Okay. But what he's saying here right from the get-go is he's establishing his authority and its source. I'm an apostle, but not because I decided I'm an apostle, but I was called by the will of God. And you can't argue with the will of God. What about the next one? about an appeal to the audience's emotions. Do you see anything like that in this, these first couple of verses? Something that's asking them to emotionally engage with the author. And remember that, that the pathos, this emotional engagement, can it doesn't have to just be good emotions. Any kind of emotional sort of uh, effect can be considered a pathos. Where do you see this emotion show up in just this first part? Yeah. Yeah, it kind of does a little bit. It, that gets more, more so. In it. OK, so calling them saints. And then listen to the language. Listen to the language together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. What kind of sense, what kind of feeling do you get from that? Community! That's a big Corinthians word. That sounds like community, and not just community like the real kind, but the good kind. Okay? Oh, we're all together. We have all been called to be these faithful people to the Lord. We're all, he's the Lord of all of us. Yes, this is an emotional engagement that he's asking them to make this move. Let's look real quickly at the next part. 
Amen. <laughs> and in the next part, that becomes even more obvious. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace that God has been given you in Christ Jesus for in every way you've been enriched in him. Now we know that's not true because he tells them a little way, a little uh, bit later that they're too young. You know, that, that you can't even handle meat. I've just got to feed. We know they haven't been enriched in every way. Um, but this is a rhetorical strategy. He is exhorting them to behave in a certain way and to think of themselves in a certain way. Sort of to the extent that the more you, I'm not, and I'm, this, is, this is not adequate, but sometimes you have to fake it to make it. Okay? Sometimes you have to start thinking of yourself as enriched in every way before you actually start behaving like it. And sometimes we have to remind people of their identities in order for their behavior to catch up. So even though it may look like, well, Paul's being kind of inconsistent. So he tells them right here, and then he continues, in speech and knowledge of every kind, so that you're not lacking in any spiritual gift. He's talking about this is what God has for you. This is what you've been given, but are you making the most of this? And I think that's what he's going to unpack in the rest of his letter. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, and by him you were called, re repeating again what came before, into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, what do you hear in there? Do we have an appeal to logic? And what I mean by this is some kind of a movement from a claim to either evidence or something that explains or logically connects the ideas to each other. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what he said was that this is kind of, and, and if I can take the liberty of calling it this, this is kind of a, a, an abstract for the rest of Paul's letter. Everything pretty much that gets explained throughout the letter is presented here in this, in this form, but there's these logical loops that Paul keeps going back to. He keeps coming back to the same thing. So in the beginning, when he's saying that we are called together of every place, he loops back to that same theme down at the end of verse 9. You've been called into the fellowship. He'll continuously loop back to the same point that he's making. And he's making it in lots of different ways, probably because he really wants them to get it. Look at the, look at the connecting words. The beginning of verse 5, for in every way. That's explaining what he's just said before. Beginning of verse 7, so that. Okay, he's moving logically from one idea and giving us connections is this is for, this is the purpose of that. This is for, because, this is how. And then he moves into the last part. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people, whoever those people are, uh, that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. And what I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Uh, has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? So here he's definitely moving into, I mean, I think that there's still a certain emotional, because you can hear his frustration coming in. I think that he's trying to convey that amount of frustration. But I think that really in this last part, he's really trying to make this logical appeal.
because he has something very specific that he states that he wants them to do. You need to be united with no divisions among you. And then he gives these reasons. Well, you were all baptized into Christ. Therefore, if you're all baptized into the same one, how is it that you're being divided? He's asking them logically to understand how is it that this is possible when you've all gone through this same experience and when you all claim Christ there's no way for this logically to be possible to be divided. So this is just, I realize, very basic, uh, but this is kind of the uh, an intro into looking at how rhetoric is not necessarily a step-by-step -step formula, but it's simply this linguistic means of persuading someone to see things from your perspective. And I think that's what he's asking them to do because he steps back and he repeats that called everyone in all place into the fellowship of the sun. He's essentially through these emotions, through these logical arguments, through this appeal to authority, asking them to view the situation in Corinth from his perspective. I've gotten reports, I've heard, I've heard people say that you say these things. He's asking them through rhetoric to step back and look at the argument from his point of view. And this is where, <laughs> this is kind of an interesting part of the argument because when we think about Paul strategizing, all right, the Corinthians are falling apart. How am I going to communicate what it is that I want them to do and why I think it's important. And most importantly, why is this important to God? Why does this matter? And if I'm going to appeal to God's authority, what am I trying to say about God? And so we have an interesting situation where we're, we're, we're struck, and this is why it took kind of a, a long time for literary criticism for people to really get on board because some people thought that there were issues regarding inspiration. If Paul's carefully crafting a letter and we can see his authorial hand and we can even see Paul's logic in his own mind working, how is this inspired by God? If we can see Luke's hand or Mark's hand and we see that they have carefully constructed a story with characters and with a plot and with conflict, people have often wrestled with how does that make it inspired? At what place do we see God's hand at work in that story? We've been talking through literary criticism about how we can see the author working and how we can see the narrative unity, but, some, but at the end of it, we also have to step back and say, where do we see the theological part? Where do we see how God works in this story? And obviously, in the New Testament, God is often a character in the story. God has um, um, events and revelations and speeches. Sometimes we get uh, God, just like Jesus, just like the disciples, being formed as a character literarily. But what do we do as interpreters when it's time to step back and say, how do we view this as inspired scripture? And I thought that this was a very uh, powerful quote, quotation, excuse me, uh, from Mark Allen Powell. And he says, for most Christians, the indispensable source of life and vitality of faith is neither a tentative historical reconstruction nor a set of scripturally derived doctrinal principles. That source is rather the stories of the Bible themselves, remembered, treasured, and interpreted in their narrative form. That we, just like at the very beginning when I was talking about my son being read his bedtime story, we are shaped by stories, we, and we reflect reality through stories. <clears throat> and this is one of those ways that I do think that God speaks through stories. We know that Jesus talked in parables so that people could understand as they were able to hear it. I also think that when we go back to the beginning of the biblical story and we look consistently from Genesis to the maps, 
that what we'll see is a pattern of God constantly inviting human beings to be part of creation. And part of God's work of creating. And I think that when it came to the Bible, that we have so many various authors and writers with their own literary styles, with their own voices, with their own purposes. But I think that that's in keeping with the way that we see God working throughout the stories of Scripture. That even if it, that's going to sound bad, even if it messes it up, God would rather include people. Even if it complicates it and makes it kind of messy, God would rather include people in the work of creation, whether it's the creation of, uh, the continuing creation of the world, whether it's the creation of the church, or whether it's the creation of Holy Scripture, that we are always invited to be partners in that with God. And so I think that literary criticism is a way that we can, ne we can negotiate that. But yes, I do believe that God's hand just like Luke's hand was involved. But I think that it's an invitation for us to be partners. And so we can take that partnership and continue it as we interpret it literarily. Like JR said earlier, what do I bring to this document? What images come up in my head? We're once again being invited to be partners in creating interpretation. And I think that that's good news. I don't think that that should give us uh, an exceptional cause for worry. Uh, interestingly enough, there were never wristbands that said WWPW. What would Paul write? <laughs> we asked, what would Jesus do? And what that means is that those stories had an immense power over the way our ethics were shaped over the way that we learned to treat people and over the way that we learned to interpret the, the stories of scripture. And so I guess I would say my exhortation to you would be to join God in God's work of creating and create interpretations that understand this, that navigate this, because narratives are a place where tensions are allowed to live. They don't always get resolved. Read the end of Mark, okay? They don't get resolved, okay? Even with the additional ending, it just complicates things, okay? And we live in a messy world, and we live in messy churches, and we live in messy families. Oh, mercy, we live in messy families, okay? And some of those tensions will never be resolved, and the one place that we can go for a navigation through that is through narrative. So I would invite any of my colleagues in the back, if you would like to add anything about narrative criticism, rhetorical criticism, or just criticism in general. 